So don't let anybody tell you that it's not loving if you stand flat-footed and speak the truth about this issue of homosexuality. What's not loving is to look someone in the eye when God says they are in jeopardy of an eternity in hell and merely wink and nod at their sin because you're afraid of being called names. So what's wrong with homosexuality? Um, a number of things, but just a few in this context. Number one, it's a violation of the created order. It's a violation of the created order. It's not how we were made. Secondly, it denounces procreation categorically. It denounces procreation categorically. And I say categorically because, you know, the homosexual lobby, they try to be slick. Or are you saying that people who are beyond childbearing years shouldn't get married? No, because categorically, they are still the two corresponding parts of humanity that produce children and produce a family that is designed to raise, rear, and protect children. So categorically, they're still in the same ballpark even if they don't have children. Thirdly, it blasphemes the illustration. It blasphemes the illustration. This is especially true when we understand the illustration of Christ and his bride, the church. And then finally, it denies the very need for sanctification because it takes what God calls sinful and calls it righteous. God calls this an abomination and we instead call it righteous. It's the only sin, by the way, for which God destroyed cities with fire and brimstone. It's unique. It's unique. It's not like other sins. It's unique. Not all sins are called abominations. Homosexuality is unique in that regard. Very few sins in that category. And not all sins were the, ended in God destroying twin cities with fire and brimstone. It's unique in that regard. Not all sins are talked about in the Bible, like in Romans 1, as having a penalty in the flesh. Homosexuality is. It's unique in that regard. But listen to this. To suggest in public that homosexuality might be chosen is to open the can of worms labeled moral choice and sin and give the religious intransigence a stick to beat us with. Straits must be taught that it is as natural for some persons to be homosexual as it is for others to be heterosexual. Wickedness and seduction have nothing to do with it. And since no choice is involved, gayness can be no more blameworthy than straightness. I want you to notice that this is an argument from origins. This is an argument based upon their understanding of the nature of man. This is why Genesis matters. They're arguing that this is the way we were made, or this is the way that we have evolved, and therefore there is no morality associated with it. Now, this is a dangerous statement to make. I, I mean, suppose, you know, we can, we can say that I have a genetic pre predisposition toward violence. Does that make it okay? Because we can prove that I have a genetic predisposition? If I have a genetic predisposition toward drunkenness, does that make it okay? And so, out of step with psychology, what? Psychology proves this stuff? Yeah, because everybody knows that that's how people are born, right? We have the LeVay brain study, you know, uh, Bailey, Bailey and Pillard's twin study. Um, we have Hamer's X chromosome study. Um, you know, we've got uh, Savick's pheromone study. By the way, none of these things, none of these things, none of these things has proven a genetic connection to homosexuality. So this is how they argue. One way they argue is this. They say homosexuality is, an, is as immutable as ethnicity. You've heard that, right? It's immutable. It's just like ethnicity. It's just like your race. That's not true. Uh, by the way, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. That's 2,000-year-old evidence that people stop being homosexual. 2,000-year-old evidence.
another thing you do as far as jamming, you want to understand what jamming is. Jamming works when you take two contradictory images and juxtapose them. And so Christian people hate the idea of the Nazis and the skinheads and the KKK. So what you do is you portray people who are against same-sex marriage as being akin to Nazis, skinheads, and the KKK. Since nobody wants to be accused of being a Nazi, a skinhead, or the KKK, eventually nobody's going to want to be accused of being anti-same-sex marriage. This is jamming. This is why in your average Sunday sermon from a pastor that deals with homosexuality, the first third of it will be apologizing. Imagine this on a Sunday morning from a church. Now church, we're going to address the issue of adultery, but I don't want you to be alarmed. I am not here to bash adulterers. I love adulterers. I have friends who are adulterers. And I believe that our church needs to be open and accepting toward adulterers. And I want you to be, right? That just feels wrong, doesn't it? But every time a pastor goes to preach on homosexuality, we expect that to be up front. Why? Because we've been jammed. That's why. We've been jammed. It has been successful. That's why the most onerous sin that you can imagine from a scriptural perspective has us apologizing for saying what God says about it. So don't let anybody tell you that it's not loving if you stand flat-footed and speak the truth about this issue of homosexuality. What's not loving is to look someone in the eye when God says they are in jeopardy of an eternity in hell and merely wink and nod at their sin because you're afraid of being called names.